Good morning and welcome. It's lovely to see you this morning. Uh, we've got a number of our folk away, including, unfortunately, our music group. So we've got no li live music this morning, but Elizabeth's doing valiant stuff with uh, technical bits. Um, and as we come into God's presence now, let's, uh, let's just quieten our hearts and uh, ask to be refilled with his spirit so that what we do today is in relationship with, with him. That's why we've come here, to be in relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. Father God, thank you that you love us without limit. And here we are to come and bring you our praises. Please fill us with your spirit now and make our worship genuine. Amen. Get into a position that you like to, to worship. You may stand or kneel or sit, whatever it, where you're comfortable to come and worship the Lord.
how by your grace we come. Isn't it lovely that we can be together in God's presence? It's lovely to welcome you today and especially good to welcome some visitors. I hope you're having a really good, good holiday. H- how much longer are you going to be here? All right, so you won't be here next Sunday. D- because next Sunday we've got a, a, a family service, a breakfast church down in the Fairfield Centre. So um, I, I was going to give you a, an, an invitation for that. If you can extend your holiday, can you try that? It, Try and squeeze another couple of days in. Try that. Or even a week more, because the following week uh, we've got our uh, 200th anniversary and um, we're going to celebrate together and celebrate harvest as well. God has been so good to us, has blessed us in so many ways. We want to say thank you. Uh, And then we'll have a, a, a meal afterwards in the back room. If you can come to that, can you come back? If you can come to that, Sign on the, on the bit of paper in there, then we know how many to cater for. Um, I think most of the other things are on the news sheet. I don't need to mention too much. Um, except perhaps I can me- mention we're going to start the bereavement journey course. I think uh, people have got quite a bit upset during the Queen's death and funeral and stuff. And, and it's brought back memories of, of past issues. Uh, and so we're going to run that course. I, I, if you'd like to be involved, let me know uh, and we can sort out uh, an appropriate place and time, well, time to, to do that. I think all the other things I'll just leave you to read on the notice sheet. Yeah. So let's continue worshipping the Lord as we sing our next song, Amazing Grace. This is the Chris Tomlin version of that with, with the chorus. Let's, uh, let, <laughs> we've been set free. We're not limited and, and, and cramped. Jesus has set us free. Let's appreciate that. You might like to stand as we sing together. Oh, baby.
So let's uh, come and give God our praise and our thanks. Mick's going to lead us in our prayer today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us into your presence this morning. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for bringing us into the relationship with you that we have through your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you have done for people like us through him. Thank you, Lord God, for the countless millions of people who have come to know salvation through Christ, through your amazing grace and love and mercy. As we look back, Lord, at our walk with you in these past days, we bless you that we are able to see the way in which your presence has touched our lives. Indeed, your word tells us that you are the one who never sleeps and that while we sleep, your spirit is at work nurturing and protecting us, guarding our thoughts and our mind's activity. We pray, Lord, that we may be more conscious of the way you guard your people moment by moment every day, the way you have kept us from harm in these past days, the way you have kept us safe as we have travelled to and fro in a, an environment that doesn't make safety a first priority always. We bless you that you are the one who watches over us so that we can be here this morning worshipping you, giving you our thanks and our praise. Lord, we ask that in this world, in the position that mankind is in, in these days, life and livelihoods being threatened on every side by all kinds of malevolent activity, that we may know your love, your grace, your protection, and give to you, our Heavenly Father, the praise, the thanks, the devotion that you deserve from people like us. We bless you, Lord, today and pray that you will continue with us this morning and in these coming days to show to us what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mick. The young girl was given the job of sweeping out the hallway, and there was a tiled floor there. So she was sweeping and sweeping, and she was doing a good job. She was getting down on her hands and knees and had got the dustpan and brush and was, was cleaning it and brushing it out. And then she came to 
the mat near the door. And she thought, oh, I can't be bothered to do that. Well, I, it, it'll look all right if, if I don't. And then she thought, no, no, I better not. So she goes and she picks it up. She opens the door and goes outside, and waves the, the mat around to, to get it clean. And, and then she finds there's a parcel on the doorstep. It's for her. Someone sent her a, a surprise gift, a, a, a special present. Oh, fantastic. So she takes that in and goes and un unwraps it to find out what, what, it, what it is. And then a moment later, she looks outside and it's absolutely bucketing down with rainfall. Absolutely bucketing down. And her present would have been spoilt if she'd left it outside there on the doorstep in, in all this rain. Wasn't it good that she did the job thoroughly and took the mat outside and, and, and shook it and got it clean? We don't always get a reward for being thorough. We don't always. But we strive because we have a hope in the living God. He's given us tasks to do, and because we are his people, we're going to do them thoroughly. We're going to do them properly. Not necessarily looking for a reward, but we're going to be careful to do them well. In a moment, we're going to have our, our reading, and um, David's going to come and read for us. But I, I think because God wanted the, the good message, the good news, to get to the Gentiles. So God sent a special vision to Peter, which was telling him, don't you call anything unclean that I've made clean. Meanwhile, 30 miles away at uh, the city of Caesarea, there was a Roman centurion called Cornelius. And he was serious about trying to get a relationship with, with God. And God sent a messenger to him saying, get Peter to come and tell you the truth, tell you the good news. So he sent uh, three of his men to go and find Peter at Joppa and Peter, just having had this vision about not calling anything unclean, calling something unclean if it was really God's will, then comes with those three men, and he actually brings some friends of his own, I think about half a dozen of them. So there are ten of them then coming to Cornelius' house in, in Caesarea. When they get there, what happens? Cornelius bows down to Peter. And Peter says, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a god. You mustn't do that. So Cornelius had to learn that Peter was not a god. Peter had to learn that Cornelius was not a dog. They've got lessons to learn. And so Peter, uh, Cornelius says, I've got all my friends here. I've got the family here. We want you to come and tell us the good news about how we can get a relationship with God. And so that's where we start the story today, the story of Peter's message. David's going to read it to us. The reading this morning is from Acts 10, verses 34 to 48. I shall do my best to read it and my reward will be the joy of being able to read it. Peter began, I now see how true it is that God has no favourites, but that in every nation the man who is God-fearing and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent his word to the Israelites and gave good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. I need not tell you what happened lately over all the land of the Jews, starting from Galilee, after the baptism proclaimed by John. You know about Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit 
and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he can bear witness to all that he did in the Jewish countryside and in Jerusalem. He was put to death by hanging on a gibbet, but God raised him to life on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to the whole, the whole people, but to witnesses whom God had chosen in advance, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to proclaim him to the people and affirm that he is the one who has been designated by God as judge of the living and the dead. It is to him that all the prophets testify, declaring that everyone who trusts in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And we go on, and the passage from now on is, is entitled, a Gentile convert receive the Spirit. Peter was still speaking when the Holy Spirit came upon all who were listening to the message. The believers who had come with Peter, men of Jewish birth, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out even on Gentiles. For they could hear him speaking in tongues of ecstasy and acclaiming the great God, greatness of God. Then Peter spoke. If anyone prepared to withhold the water for baptism from these persons who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did ourselves, then he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. After that, they asked him to stand on them for a time. This is the word of God. Thank, thanks so much, David. So that's the, the picture we've got then of Peter going into Cornelius' house. He's got a, a, a bunch of his family and friends all gathered there, ready to hear the good news. These are Gentiles. They are not people who have a traditional Jewish background. Cornelius has been sincere in wanting to find out about God, and now Peter comes and he tells him. And... and there are several things to notice. And it, this is just the, the simple good news expressed very clearly here by Peter. The first thing is that God sent Jesus. Some people have the idea that God is, a, is an angry, wrathful God and he's, he's out to, to get people and, and, and put them down. And, and that what was needed was a, a, a gentle Jesus to come and do something and, and pacify him. Not at all. God is a loving God, for God so loved the world that he sent his Son. God's love for, for the world that he's made, for the people that, that he's made, is, is continuing throughout the generations. God is a God of, of love. God our Saviour wants all people to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 3. God has poured out his love into our hearts, Romans 5, 5. Here is God, a God of love, looking for his people, looking to save his people. That's why he sent Jesus. God sent Jesus. The second thing is that Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus had given up all his godly attributes. He was a real human being. He, he, he felt tired. He felt hungry. He, was, he got thirsty. He suffered pain. He, he, he identified totally with human beings. He's given up all the attributes of, of a holy God to live with us. So what he was doing in life was because he got God's spirit in him. He was truly human, but filled with the spirit of God. Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
And that, it, that enabled him to heal the sick, didn't it? And uh, to cast demons out of people who are demon-possessed, to set people free. It enabled him to calm the storm, to walk on the water, to multiply food, turn water into wine. This was the power of God's Spirit in Jesus. Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. The third thing to notice is that Jesus was crucified. Oh, the horror of that. It just, just to think of what this sinless Son of God suffered. It, it, it's just awesome, isn't it? And it, the, the way it's, it's put there uh, um, was that Jesus was put on a tree or a stake or a gibbet or a, a, a beam or a pole. He's, the writer is putting this like this because in Deuteronomy it says, cursed is everyone who is put on a pole, put on a stake, put on a tree. So Jesus was taking the curse for us. Cursed is everyone who is, who is put on a tree. And then Paul tells us that the, our curse was on him. He took that curse for us. So we've been set free. Christ redeemed us. He saved us. He rescued us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's why the writer is putting it in that way. Fourthly, he was raised from the dead. Jesus didn't stay in the grave, but he was, he was, God raised him. On the third day, as Jesus had said again and again and again, three times in consecutive chapters in Mark's Gospel, Jesus tells his friends, his followers, I'm going to be raised on the third day. They're going to put me on a cross, but I'm going to be raised on the third day. This was exactly fulfilled at the resurrection of Jesus. He was raised from the dead, fourthly. And fifthly, the apostles were eyewitnesses of this. They saw what was going on. They didn't read it in a book. They hadn't heard about it. They saw it with their own eyes. John is very emphatic about this. In, in, look at his first letter. We, we touched him. We walked with him. The word of life, we've, we've shared life with him. What Peter and the other apostles were talking about was something they had seen and known for, uh, for themselves. There's something that was very clear. And actually, to, th this was uh, an important thing for me when I grasped the truth of this, that here were people writing about their own personal experiences. It, it, it wasn't theory. This was really happening. These, John and Peter and the other apostles were writing from their own experience. And, and, and that experience impacted their own lives. They had been frightened, hadn't they, when Jesus had been put to death. Will the authorities come and, and get us? So they were hiding away. They were behind locked doors. But then, when Jesus was raised, when, when he sent his spirit to them, they're completely different people. They're not hiding away. They're boldly sharing the good news that, that they've got. They're eyewitnesses. They're telling everybody the good things that, uh, that, that they've experienced, that they've known. Uh, and sixthly, we've noticed in those verses that there's forgiveness and an, a, a, a totally new relationship. This is, think, think back what like, life was like right at the beginning of Genesis. God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He was sharing life with his human friends. And this is the restoration of that close relationship. Restored, we're in, we're in the family. We're brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ. We're heirs of all God's goodness. 
Look, if it was just our sins being forgiven, that would be great, wouldn't it? Absolutely great. Yeah, all, all the bad stuff in our lives that, that we've thought and spoken and done, if all that's forgiven. That would be absolutely great, but it's so much more than that. That's just part of it. We're given a whole new life in relationship with our, with our loving Father. We're sons and daughters. You are my son. You are my daughter. I call you by name. I know you. Here is this close relationship that, that, that is restored through what Jesus has done. Children of the Most High. Here is love beyond measure. Love beyond measure. Here your endless resources are given to me. Strength to the weary. Healing for our lives. We'll just reflect for a moment as we sing this song, Love Beyond Measure. beyond measure has opened my eyes. Is that true for you? Well, the result of um, Peter's speaking to the uh, Gentile audience there was, was dramatic because they were taking it all in, they were involved with it, and then God sent his spirit uh, upon them in a very evident way, so that Peter and the f half a dozen friends who were with him could see for themselves that God was in these people. God had sent his Spirit to them. So they were speaking in tongues, they, they, they were praising God and celebrating the goodness. It was very evident. And that, that's what God had done to enable the Jewish people to understand that the Gentile people had been accepted just as the Jews had found out that they had got God's Spirit coming to them, so God's Spirit is coming to the Gentile people now. And you know, they, they just couldn't deny it. It was, it was there, it was evident. God was making it very sure and clear to them that these Gentile people were now Jesus' followers, really, really and truly. So, that's for us too, isn't it? Isn't it? As we are his people, he wants to fill us with his spirit. Give us the gifts of his spirit. Help the fruit of his spirit to grow in us, that love, that joy, that peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He wants to grow those in us. So, what, what, what do you do now? 
what, what, what's Peter and, and, and the others to do now? Well, they said, well, look, these people are, are, are clearly followers of, of Jesus now, so let's baptize them and, and, and make that clear. Now, we don't know how they would baptize there. They're close to the sea. Maybe they went down and baptized them in the sea. We, the, the last baptisms we've had here, we've uh, baptized folk in, in the sea. Um, or, or maybe they had a tank in the kitchen, or maybe they poured water over them, or, or whatever. The method isn't important. The, the significant thing is that they have been baptized. They are now members of God's family. Remember what ba baptism means. Baptism means, one, a, a, a washing, a cleansing. The old sinful life is washed clean. And secondly, as you go into the water, that's a picture of, of death, of dying, and then coming out again, it's a picture of new life. So here's, here's Peter and his friends saying, look, now get baptized, and you know that you've been totally cleansed, you'll know that you've come up to this totally new life. And so, that, 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 there they are, getting baptized. Amazing, isn't it? These are Gentile, crowd of Gentiles getting baptized into the Christian faith. And then, what did they do? They asked Peter to stay for a few days. Why? Why? And Peter's now happy to do that. He's, he's learned his lesson. He's learned that these Gentiles aren't dogs. They're brothers and sisters. They're part of the same family. So he's going to stay but they realize they need to learn. It, 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 getting baptized, becoming a part of the Christian family is not an end of the matter. It's just a start. They've got to learn and grow. Is that what you're doing? Learning, growing, maturing, letting that fruit grow in you. That's God's purpose for your life. Joining a church, getting baptized, is just the start of it. The real thing is the progress. So they say to Peter, can you hang on and, and, and stay with us and, t and teach us for a bit? So how's, how's your growth going? Are, are, are you listening to God every day, reading his word? Are, have, have you joined a house group or something where you can learn and grow with others. God wants us to take our faith seriously. It's not just a question of turning up on a, on a Sunday morning for an hour or so. He wants us to take our faith seriously and grow and mature and develop. Are we doing that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truths that we've uncovered this morning, truths that you've shown us. Perhaps, perhaps each one has learnt something different, but we want to keep on learning, keep on growing. Father, we, we're living in a world of so much falsehood, lies, fake news, hostility. Oh, there's, there's just so much awful going on in the world. We think of, of Ukraine, for the floods in, in Pakistan, for the, the typhoon in Southeast Asia, for the hurricane in the southern states of the, of the United States. And then in, in, in our own, own country, the economic chaos, the turmoil on the money markets, the energy crisis. 
and COVID rates on the rise. Lord, so many things. It seems like, like the world's in a great storm. But thank you, Father, that Jesus stills the storm. He stilled the storm when the disciples were in the boat. He walked on the water when the storm was raging. Father, we want you to still the storms in our own lives and, and emotions. As, as, as we get anxious about stuff, Lord, please still that storm. Let us know that we've got that firm anchor because we belong to you. We, 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 we're your children. And we bring those many issues, those storm issues to you, Lord, and ask that you will bring your peace in your way and in your time. Thank you that you are a God of faithfulness. So today we commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to growing daily in our understanding of you and in our experience of your faithfulness. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll sing now that uh, lovely hymn as we close, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You might like to stand to sing.
We've now got uh, refreshments available in the back room. I hope you're all going to stay and have a cup of tea, coffee, and something lovely to eat. So please, everyone, stay for that. We can have a good chat together. Now hear God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you a peaceful heart in the storm. Amen.